Okay. So, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you on this e-learning platform organized by SCMPCR. This is Manvi Dikshit, our moderator for group discussion today. This is the last session of the series ELP03. I request you all to show your active participation in this group discussion. If you have any queries, group uh, doubts and suggestions, please feel free to type in the chat box. I want this session to be more interactive and success successful. During the session, I will put uh, pick up one by one questions from the all participants. For the group discussion, we have Dr. Frank Hensley, Engineer Renate Walter, Dr. Mamun Haq, uh, Dr. Jamima Mam is not present, Dr. George. All are having very good experience in bracket therapy. So without wasting our time, I would like to hand over this session to our speakers. So I will pick up question. I have some questions. So I will start from there. Okay. Uh, shall I start, sir? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, so, what is the ideal step size used in a intracavitary bracket therapy? It is same for the avoided tandem always. The ideal. What was the second word? Sir, what is the ideal step size used in a intracavitary bracket step therapy? Step size. Yes, sir. Step size. Ah, okay. Well, I guess we can get several answers on that. Um, we use step sizes of about a centimeter. I don't think you, you, you can use more or two, that is also okay. Um, it depends a little bit on your procedure. And I think um, probably Gerg Spiegel will say use, use five millimeters and then do uh, geometric optimizing and then go on from that. But no, I think we no, can get actually, a few opinions on that. Actually, I would say it's a bit dependent first of your active source length. So there are yes. differences. For example, for our gamma mic machine, it's 3.5 millimeters, the active length. Mm -hmm. So I think with five millimeter, you are on a good, good site. And then I would also argue, I mean, for a cylinder application, you can of course use one centimeter step size because you are far away from your source. Yep. But if you are doing, let's say, interstitial treatments, or if you do a lung treatment where the source is in small, very small catheters, and it's lying directly on tissue, then of course it makes sense to reduce the step size because then you distribute the dose to more positions and you mm -hmm. avoid hot spots. Because uh, if you have really hot spots, for example, in the lung, you can burn holes into small blood vessels and then you have a bleeding and bleeding into the lung is very dangerous. So in this um, respect, I would always um, think about what kind of procedure is that and how close are the sources to the tissue? Yes, uh, okay. could I make a comment? Uh, sure, sir. Uh, I would tell from my experience from uh, microselectron or niclotron. And as uh, Georg said, then this depends naturally on treatment length because in the micro selector, you can select maximum 49 positions in each channel, yes. which means if you, if you choose a step size of 2.5 millimeter, then you can have maximum 12 centimeter. If the treatment length is longer than 12 centimeter, then you have to go to five millimeters. So you choose mm -hmm. on the basis of the length or something like that. So uh, what, shorter, uh, I would shorter like to length is always forward. better. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so, oh, sorry. Uh, we use uh, the microselectron as well. So I'm experienced mm -hmm. on this machine. Um, one point, uh, we use, uh, use usually a five millimeter step size, but for esophageal treatment, sometimes it happens uh, when you treat the upper esophagus, you have to um, switch to one centimeter because, um, uh, or you have to, to work with uh, some experiment with some offsets or something like that, which is, always tricky and risky. Mm -hmm. So in this case, uh, to reach the upper part of the uh, esophagus, we have to switch to one centimeter. So, and um, sometimes we use 2.5. Yes, ma'am. Uh, or uh, 2.5 um, millimeter step size. This, uh, sorry, did I said centimeter? 25, ma'am. Uh, so, yeah, um, no, uh, we use one centimeter step size for esophagus. We use for a vaginal treatment 0 0.5 centimeters, so five millimeters. And we use 2.5 millimeters, sometimes 
when we treat around the eye or somewhere else. Um, uh, something like this, or for um, lesions inside uh, or recurrences of glioblastoma. Um, we did treatment of lung, but we had these nice Fritz applicator, which is no longer available, unfortunately. So we had not that uh, risk of um, very high dose at the tissue in the lung. So we have to see how we go on um, in the future with lung treatments. But I think um, one, uh, 0 0.5 centimeters is a good uh, approach to start. Good compromise. Okay. Um, I have uh, uh, seen somewhere in a uh, written directive, uh, uh, 2.5, what you have said now, 0.5, and one centimeter, but 2.5 I have uh, seen somewhere, it is written, one centimeter has to be divided in a one by fourth during the implant. Like in avoid now, we continuous activate the dual positions, but in the tandem because the length is more. So we uh, geometrically make and say, we uh, change the dual positions. And on the top, we uh, put one active position, then on the, from the flange side now, it be reduced. Sometimes in you know, some planning, the doctor has said, uh, you compromise in the dose, uh, in a uh, bladder dose and a rectum dose. At that time, we play with the dual positions activation. I'm not, I'm not sure about if you can use more than one step size in the same plan. No, sir. If I'm it not is a temporary possible. plant, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sir, Sorry. we change the dwell position activation. Yeah. Like ma'am said now, uh, better use 0 yeah. 0.5 mm on one, mm. in some cases we have to use one centimeter also. Like yeah. that, we change the dwell positions. Is mm. it right yeah. method yeah. in the You can, you can yeah. select every second dwell position if, if that is practical, yes. Mm. Yeah, I think in general, I, I, in general, I think it's, it's uh, you should select the dwell positions as close to another as you, as, mm. as possible and is the sensible and mm -hmm. then and then optimize because that keeps the keeps each dwell time lower mm -hmm. and you have less hot uh, you have less dose and um and you have more uh, possibility to uh, to to vary the uh, more, more dwell positions at which you can vary and you can modulate better yeah it probably does not make much sense to make the dwell uh, step size uh, smaller than the sh than the source length and that okay. is typically three and a half, four millimeters, something like that. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. So one is this question we have from the sheets is three point five millimeter active length. Mm -hmm. Okay, sir. Three point. So one question we have from the Asad. Tell us about transient dose. Does planning system incorporate the dose? Uh, I can. Dose. I can just answer this from our machines. So the planning system does not take into account the transit dose. Okay. So it just assumes that you have an infinitive small time that the wire moves from one to the next source position. So it does not take into this into account, but the machine takes it to into, into account. So it just um, moves from a, from a position. And when it starts moving from position one, for example, to position two, it already accounts for the trial time of position two. So that is one possibility. So it counts down the trial time of position two when it starts moving from position one. So you don't have additional time and you don't have additional dose. Mm -hmm. It smears the dose distribution a little bit, but considering the time and the speed of the wire, this is, is a very, very small amount that it's, that it's uh, let's say that it's different from your planning system. And there is another approach that the machine takes this into account that it creates a region around source positions and, and just takes, takes the real calculated time that it needs to move the wire into account for the, for the dose distribution and for the timing in the points in the stopping positions. Mm -hmm. So I can just say from, from Varian machines, this transit time is taken into account and you don't deliver more dose than you plan. Okay, sir. This is done during the commissioning? No, this is done no. with every treatment. Every, every treatment. treatment, okay. okay sir. Yeah, because the machine properties are defined. The machine knows that the wire, for example, for the Bravos machine, moves a maximum speed of one meter per second. 
and then it can calculate. It's an acceleration phase, it's a deceleration phase, but the system can calculate and measure the time exactly to a precision of one millisecond. Okay, sir. As per the plan, it calculate. For the plan, it does not take this into account. There, it just displays the, the dose okay. distribution as if it would take no time to move the source wire. Okay. So during the treatment procedure, it will incorporate the transi transition time. Correct. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, one more question, sir. What is the recommended maximum depth can be treated with the surface mold? Sorry, the maximum time? The recommended depth. maximum depth. Treatment depth in a surface uh, mold. Well, we, uh, we treat a maximum three millimeter because we use the surface mold um, uh, called Freiburg flap. Um, so we are in five millimeter uh, distance yes. and we do um, not like um, the, I think there is an actual Jack Astro um, recommendation. They recommend to um, prescribe on three, maybe to five millimeter tissue depth. Uh, we do our prescription to the surface, to the contact surface. This is because it is, in my opinion, much easier to place um, uh, these points clearly there. So I know where is my source, where is my um, contact between mold and skin. And I can clearly place some points, but it's getting more um, difficult if you want to place several points in three millimeter tissue depth. This is the reason why we do not go along with this uh, recommendation. And um, I think um, you have a good uh, coverage until uh, three millimeter tissue depth with this. Um, other people say, okay, you can go up to um, five millimeters. However, there are um, publications available uh, um, from a colleague in, uh, in Tehran, Ramin Javeri, and he worked with, um, uh, with larger tissue depth. For this, he used um, uh, a thicker mold so that there is added one or two centimeter between um, the mo uh, between um, catheters and skin. So you are in an area of a lower gradient. So when you go down to one centimeter or even more, you do not have this uh, high dose at, uh, at the surface or at the skin surface as if you had when you use only five millimeter distance to the skin surface. Uh, can uh, I? Yeah, yeah, please. If you're finished, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to say one more sentence. Um, yeah. When you use this uh, five millimeter distance, which comes up with this um, uh, flaps coming from the companies, um, I think um, five millimeter is is the maximum, but um, usually we use a three millimeter, we say down to three millimeter. We have mm -hmm. a good coverage. And for something which is going deeper than five millimeters, uh, we think about adding some interstitial uh, catheters, or uh, we have to think about um, uh, external beam uh, treatment with electrons like 6 and V. Mm -hmm. uh, in in our hospital, we have done few surface mold cases. So we have done an extensive uh, work on surface mold in terms of depth and the dose distribution or something like that. Uh, the work is also published. So if you want a copy of the paper, then I can send it to you. And there we have seen that the best procedure is when you select the depth, the skin dose should not be more than 110 to 115%. So we keep the depth like that so that we don't keep the skin dose is not more than 110 and 115%. And especially we take care of the eye. That means we don't give too much dose to the eye and also to the ear lobe or something like that here. So take it as a critical organ or something like that. So, uh, the, I can send you a copy if you want. Yeah. Uh, I would like to have this copy, please. Please send okay. me this copy, sir. <laughs> okay, if I have your email address, then I will. Send. Yeah, you okay. find it in the, uh, in the emails we got from the organizers. Maybe um, I will, I'll send you a, 
the thesis of one of my students who has done the work also. Okay. So the, it was his project also. He has Thank done you. his master's. And, this will be great. And, and also the publication. Thank you. Okay. Ma'am, one question is on machine, we give offset for a ring applicator, not on planning. That is shown in lecture seven. Is that right approach in a ring applicator? There is no offset for a ring applicator? Um, I think it was not my lecture, but however, uh, the ring applicator. Yeah, George, is... uh, Dr. George can tell. Uh, okay. Because... Yeah. Um, actually, I just opened my presentation. If I can quickly show that again, maybe then it becomes a bit clearer. Um, but host dis disabled sharing, so I can't sh show that. Or you need to activate it somehow. Um, but Sir, I, I activate it now. Now maybe you will be able to share. OK, let me see. Mm -hmm. Yep, works. So let me just um, show that again. Uh, so can you see that? Yes, sir. OK, so the point is um, that what you can see here, this is just uh, you see the ring applicator and you see the wire in the ring. And you see the ring channel is much bigger than, than um, let's say, the wire diameter. If you retract the source, like I'll do now, you see that at some point, the wire comes to the inner wall of the ring. And so as it moves, the shape of the wire changes, the tension changes, and the real tip of the wire and the plant position deviate from each other. And that is, as I mentioned, um, it is, you can't avoid this. This is the nature of these ring channels. And we tried many things. We have uh, made the ring channels smaller. We have polished the ring channel. If you make it smaller, you get such a high tension that it's difficult to move the wire in move and the wire out. In the circle. Yes, sir. And, and if you have an equidistant, let's say, difference, so that your source position has, let's say, always the same difference between the real active tip and the planning system, like it's shown more or less here, you have a similar uh, difference, then you can work with this common offset that is mentioned in your question. So you can, on the afterloader side, you can say, okay, I measure always, let's say, three millimeter difference. So I just put another offset for this on the afterloader side. And so the cable is tightened immediately, uh, even with the first source position, it's tightened to the inner wall. And then you, if you have an equidistant uh, step size, then it's fine. But if you have, let's say, positions that are not exactly the same, um, I think, in the next slide, this is somehow shown. So for example, when I, when I run that here again, and you see that on this, um, this autoradiograph, the spots are not exactly the same distance to the plant source positions. Then you need to compensate this individually. And, and the uh, technique that I showed here to change the path of the ring channel, that works quite good. So you can use that um, because if you, there's another possibility, you can manipulate uh, the plan, you can create a second plan that you send to the machine to compensate this. But the problem is that your uh, dosimetry plan reports the dose back to, the, to your point A, to your rectum point and so on. And if the machine reports the dose back and you manipulate the plan just for the machine, then these figures would be not correct anymore. So it's in this case, it's important that you can modify um, the positions. As I showed here, this is one example that we that I recommend uh, when you use drag division. Of course, if you use on Centra or any other planning system, there might be another possibility to do that. You see here on the right side of this window now how I move the theoretical plan position to the active spots or footprints of my 
um, Gaffchronic film. And if I do that step by step, I can save this plan later of a, as a standard plan and can use it for any patient treatment. I can still vary the 12 positions, uh, 12 times in the positions for the individual patient, but I know that the machine will place the source exactly where I planned this. Uh, I hope that is halfway clear. You see now that the positions are matching with the Gaffchronic film um, footprints, and therefore I can save this plan as a standard plan and reuse it for any patient. Mm, sir, I have a doubt. I haven't used this ring applicator. In a starting of this slide, now you have seen, you have shown that uh, the circle of this na, wire was overlapping from the starting of this ring construction. And right now, it, it has some gap between uh, the two ends of this circle. So, yeah. The, yeah so, the this is, yeah, prop, this is just, uh, that is so, the, that is, in this case, it's the specific ring design. So, this is a plastic ring where, where the channel is clued into the ring, and there is really an overlapping part where it exits the ring. Yeah. So, this, this does really exist, this overlapping part. This is on two levels, but we treat only in one plane. Of course, we don't use source positions that go out of the plane. Yes, sir. So may I add something for uh, users of Electra equipment? Um, we do, uh, when, when we use the ring applicator, we do always um, a reconstruction based on um, special marker wires, which should be or must be inserted when you do the imaging for this. And then there is a clear um, workflow how to reconstruct this, that you meet the points of your markers in your reconstruction. And they, they give some um, exact positions where you should, how you should reach that. Um, and the other opportunity is to use um, the library for guiding. So they uh, offer, um, a library for guiding applicators. Um, in our opinion, it is quite expensive, <laughs> however, um, but it makes it much easier to meet it. So uh, in our house, our users of, um, of Electra equipment, they are quite used uh, to this offset, which might be different depending on the applicator they use. Um, but for the um, ring applicator, we, we do it always with a marker. And so when you start with the first position of the marker, this is the uh, offset zero position then. Okay. Uh, do but you, you put can take any a, a clear look to your, uh, to your manual for the, so each uh, applicator should come along with, uh, with some information and especially for the ring applicator, every user should have uh, the uh, manual for this ring applicator where it's written down um, how to use it and how to reconstruct from the um, marker wire. Okay, we have next question from the Deepak Sumanjha. What is the inclusion and an exclusion criteria for esophageal brachy? Does recommendations planning objective? Any recommendations for the planning Depends on objective? The patient. I think this is something you need to discuss with your radiation oncologist. The problem yeah. with esophageal um, brachytherapy is that you get high surface doses, and this, this can cause complications, and you want to avoid that. So it depends on how, well, it depends on the tumor, how, how, uh, how it's lying. Is it really more advantageous to, to do this with brachytherapy or maybe with rotational therapy and with external beam? This is something you, you, need, to, you need to discuss. It's not a question of, of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the dose recommendations or so. It's, it's more a question of how you can, um, how you can reach this tumor with your tech with the technique you're using <clears throat> and generally if you if you're doing things like that um, it's recommendable to use if you have it something like a distancing applicator um, distancing applicators have uh, um, well they, they have uh, um, they're, they're the 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 source uh, catheter runs inside a uh, a second plastic uh, um, tube, and the plastic tube has a possibility that you can that it can extract little um, of, of like little like little legs that that will center it, 
they sometimes call them centering applicators. You should look, this, look at this in, uh, in your catalog if you can find it. I'm, I don't believe I have a, have a picture of it, but what you see is, is that there, you, have a, you have your catheter in the center and then this, this plastic tube outside um, has, has little extensions which, uh, that, you can, that you can more or less blow up. Uh, and, and then it, um, it, it, it has a larger distance from the surface. But and, it is uh, giving some kind of surface area plastic surface area yeah, from the yeah. source, like in a surface mold, ma'am was telling now, three mm or something like that. Yes. It will work on a esophagus uh, canal, like I can say esophagus. Yes, yeah, something like that. It's it, and it, it, it's extendable. You can you you okay. uh, you, you turn a, a screw or, or or pull a pull a little lever on the, on this applicator, and then these these extension legs um, move out and and center the applicator uh, in. Uh, to, uh, Farther away from the from the from the distance, yeah, or from, from the from the from the surface. Just want to yeah. add one comment: these these baskets that you can use with the applicator. The this is an applicator that is also used for bronchial treatment because the patient wants to breathe during the during the uh, procedure. So you need something that does not close your your um, bronchus, and therefore you have these uh, baskets. Of mm -hmm. course, you can use the same applicator also in the esophagus. Uh, yes. But for the esophagus, we have also solid, uh, so-called bougie applicators that have a different diameter. They exist in eight and ten and twelve millimeter diameter, which can be used as an um, esophageal applicator as well. Yeah. I, uh, oh, Renata has some questions. Yeah, I think so. Uh, so we use uh, we use this um, basket um, applicator for bronchus. Only not, I think we never used it for esophagus. Um, but unfortunately, it is for Elector in the moment not available. So we could not replace ours um, because after a couple of years, you have to replace it. Uh, so, um, and unfortunately, they changed their bougie uh, <laughs> applicator as well. We are not that happy with the new one. They will change it again, <laughs> but we have to wait for this. However, um, we use it in uh, 10 millimeter and uh, 12 or 13 millimeter diameter. And uh, wow. we, uh, we did um, a prescription into five millimeter tissue depth by approximately quite often five gray. So this gives a surface dose of, um, I think 7.5 gray um, to the uh, esophageal surface or mode. And, um, one point is these uh, uh, Fritz applicators. So this was the name of this basket where the patient can still breathe when you use it in the bronchos is the length where you can treat is not that long. There were, this type we had was only for um, five or four centimeter treatment length. But uh, in esophagus, you use usually um, plus two centimeters up and down from your lesion. So um, four centimeter is a little bit short. So this is the reason why we use usually longer um, or we treat over a, a longer, um, we have a longer treatment length. And so for this, we, we always use these bougie applicators. Um, and we did this or in our hospital, it is uh, done sometimes uh, previous to um, an external beam therapy for boosting the region sometimes when the uh, the tumor was pretty small they said okay after uh, after external beam therapy it is not any more visible so they did um, the bracket therapy first and it was followed by external beam and we got clips from the um, from the doctors of the gastrointestinal <laughs> department uh, they clipped the tumor so we knew where it is or maybe they clipped it already with this um, additional two centimeters. Uh, they talk, uh, so the physicians talk together and decide how they want to do this. And we just pick it up as the, uh, the physician told us and do the um, uh, activation of the dwell positions there. So usually we have more than four centimeter, usually six to even 10 centimeter treatment length. Uh, sometimes it is done in special cases when the patients are already uh, treated elsewhere. So in a, in a recidive situation or recurrency, 
it is very good to use this and um, it it uh, depends a little what of it is, as frank already said what else you can offer to the patient in your department so today for today with vmat you can get you can reach quite high doses for the esophagus um, which was uh, or which is sometimes very difficult to reach when you can only go by step and shoot or even something like conformal 3D techniques. So uh, if it's not possible to go with uh, VMAT, um, it is very good to give a boost by uh, brachytherapy. And even when there is VMAT, sometimes it is uh, recommended to use brachytherapy, especially in recurrencies. Mm -hmm. Maybe two comments on that, or one comment on, on that. Um, I think one thing is that uh, you should consider combining ther uh, therapies, doing using some kind of external beam, and then using brachytherapy as a boost. That will reduce the doses that you are giving and also reduce the, uh, the complication uh, probabilities, probably. <clears throat> and the second thing I wanted to mention is that you, um, you can actually also use uh, applicators from other companies. You don't need to use it from the company that, uh, that, that sold you the machine. You need to commission these applicators, but there are adapters for it between. Is not, uh, sometimes the applicators are not compat compatible with the machine. We have to purch uh, purchase the same machine, same applicators, so that we can do the planning also on the system. You have to look, but some are uh, uh, compatible. You can use them, and especially for something like, like this, this bougie applicator. Uh, I believe we all, we always had a um, we we had a micro electron, and we did use uh, a, a gamma med or even older sour wine uh, applicators that we had bought uh, previously. You need to you need to commission them, and you need to look where your source source goes in so, this, and, so and you I have, have to, you need to have a. a Hmm? For that, we have to take the license from that company also? No, no. no. Okay. That's your responsibility, what kind of applicator you use. Okay. And you, I mean, you, you need to be... Hmm? It's a bit dependent on what type it is. Of course, the machines are yes. individual. You cannot connect a source guide tube that fits into a gamma mid machine. You cannot put that into a micro electron. It just does not fit. So, yes. but if you use, uh, let's say, a closed system, and if you use, if you think about this esophagus applicator, which is a, an applicator where you put another catheter inside. So if you have a closed validated system from one vendor, you can of course use templates or like these esophagus bougies, you can use this from another vendor. This is possible, but of course you cannot, you, you don't have the connection Because to, the micro electron is very sensitive uh, uh, regarding the loose connections. If there is some loose connection, yes. it will not allow to treat the patient. Mm. Yes. Well, this is a very important point to keep that in mind that what is the material um, or the connections uh, are well enough or safe enough. Well, safety is a very big reason um, or big point. Um, however, I know that um, there are companies who are producing um, some applicators which are licensed for other vendors. So um, I know, for example, that Babic is um, uh, has in, in their catalog special um, applicators to be connected with elector machines. But when you uh, you cannot go uh, and have in your department. Uh, or using in your department a uh, baby machine and an elector machine and then in switch the so when you buy uh, from baby an applicator for elector machine it goes only with the elector machine so this is because of the connections okay ma'am thank you uh, one question from afifa uh, in cvs case i have seen normalization is done at 0 0.5 centimeter away from the surface of the applicator why is it so Which application? You mean cylinder? Yes, sir. In a sorbo cases. Yes, sir. Cylinders. We normalize. Well, that's, an that's an anatomical decision. Um, uh, when you're using a vaginal cylinder, you are treating the uh, the the wall of the of the vagina or the the uh, the um, yes the, the the vagina surface, and the if there is not a um, if there's not a solid recurrence, a large tumor. Uh, it's only the, uh, the uh, your assumption is that the uh, cancer cells are in the 
uh, vaginal mucosa in the, in the wall. And, uh, and then five millimeters will, will cover this wall. Uh, so five millimeter depth is, is, is a good position to put uh, your reference dose. Thank you. So I think it is an, uh, a standard which is widely sp uh, yeah. spread. Yeah. So of course, when you use even for vaginal uh, cuff treatment, um, a, C uh, a CT uh, scanning uh, or a CT imaging, you see that the vaginal um, mucosa is not um, five, up to five millimeter, but less or could can be less. Yeah? But it is just that since um, 50 Simple years or else, people are prescribing, the doctors are prescribing on five millimeters. So this is the base of the um, clinical experience. So we should go on yeah. with this. Okay, yeah. uh, then and it's also a question because these patients are mostly operated. So they have um, undergone the hysterectomy. They have no uterus anymore. And we know that on the scar where you stitch together the vaginal uh, ball at the top, that there are mostly the recurrences. So and therefore you just treat in this area, the first, let's say the first part of the upper vagina. And this is just um, a, a good experience with this five millimeter um, mm -hmm. uh, tissue depth. Uh, another question is of course, what is the fractionation and what's the, your prescribed dose to this? And that uh, differs. So there are people using five times five gray, four times six gray, three times seven gray. So there, is, there you see some variations but the principle is the same. They want to treat the upper part of the vagina mm. where recurrences can occur. Okay, ma'am. Uh, okay, sir, sorry. Uh, if the discrepancy between source strength locally determined and manufacturer stated value is, for example, 6%, what value can I use to plan? Okay. I can take this question. Uh, sure, what, hap what happens with uh, in our hospital is that the normally, you know, the source comes with the error of 5%. This is just a, like, a, like a safety, you can call it safety limit or something like that. So the, when we get the source certificate, it is already stated there that so much Becquerel plus minus 5%. Then when we measured, Normally, till now, I have not seen that we are beyond 1% of the absolute value. Mm -hmm. We are always within 1% or something. Sometimes we get a competition, make a competition like two person measures and who gets the best value is the champion of the day like that. And you would not believe we have reached one time like 0.1% or something like that. So you believe much on the absolute value or something like that. Now, the normal rule or, I mean, it depends on from country to country or maybe hospital to hospital. And in Australia, it is adopted at like that. If it is within plus minus 2%, then you can take the certificate value. That means you insert the certificate value. If it is more than 2%, it's 2% till 5%. So 2% to 3% and you remeasure it. And if it persists, then you take your value. If it is more than 3%, then you have to investigate really the problem. What is happening? Am I measuring something wrong or something like that? But after all the investigation, you are proved to be right. Then we always adopt our value if it is more than 2%. That means we insert the source of strength that we measure in the computer, in the treatment computer, as well as in the planning computer. I would like to add one comment. I absolutely agree, plus minus 2% is, is a good, good uh, threshold where you can say, okay, in this um, measurement, I can take the certificate value because the vendor of the source, they, they make it, uh, they, they also check, of course, the activity with two completely independent systems and under very, um, very defined conditions. So it's, it's actually a bit unlikely that we can better measure than the source vendor. 
But of course, there could be something else happening. So for example, uh, Varian or Electa or whoever has ex ex accidentally changed a certificate uh, sheet. Mm. Uh, so if you measure something that is more than, let's say, 2% or more than 3%, I would always also call the your manufacturer or your, or your vendor and ask, uh, look, we have here something that we haven't measured before. We have now 5% difference. We have never seen 5% difference. We always measure in between, let's say, 2%. Then I would always contact, uh, let's say, Electa, Bearing, or Baby or whoever is the source um, vendor and would check with them. It's worth to do. Mm -hmm. I think so, uh, when you, uh, the Electa Treatment Control has some um, safety uh, rules. So when they serve uh, the service is giving in the data, they give in a, a very long line of, um, a very long line of, uh, I think, 30, uh, 32 signs, which is uh, somehow uh, they have inside this. Um, uh, so you cannot read this, um, but however, the machine can read this and knows um, which certificate it is when it was measured and what was the measured value. And when you want to change for more than 5%, you get an error message from your control, uh, from the treatment control station that um, you should contact uh, the service of your company. This is uh, of the vendor, or in this case, Electa, because this should not happen, that you have more than uh, something like 5% deviation. And, uh, and I agree, uh, we do not have um, uh, more than 2%. Um, usually it is below 1%. One per, one but we, um, we found out first um, for many years, we used this Krieger Phantom measurement uh, workaround. And um, so you have some very nice um, uh, co uh, constants you have to give in and so on. And we had been usually um, overall for the four positions in the mean less than 1%, although I had for the single position sometimes more than 1%, something like 1.5 and the other was only uh, 0.7 or what else. Um, when we switched to the dwell, uh, t uh, dwell type chamber, um, we got a, um, we had a larger, um, we had a larger deviation and <laughs> we uh, compared this and then we asked uh, our company who sold us uh, this, um, uh, this dwell type chamber and talk to them and then they uh, had to correct their um, uh, certification of the dwell type chamber. So there, it might happen to, to have an, um, at an offset there too. So there was a systematically offset between our dwell type chamber and our Krieger fan to work around. Ma'am, you are saying well type chamber, right? Yeah, we are using now well type chamber. Okay. And we are around 1% deviation. Yes, I believe well type chamber is, is recommendable. I think there's a question coming up on that. Um, that is the, uh, that I think is the most reproducible uh, measurement that you can make. If you, if you do it in a phantom, for instance, um, you will see that your source is not quite isotropic. If you rotate the source or rotate the, uh, the detector uh, around the source in, in a phantom, you, you can get um, one or two percent difference um, in, in, uh, the in measurement. And, mm -hmm. uh, and a well chamber won't have this effect. So it's, it's, it's more, much more reproducible. And, and also, also for the fact that uh, with the well cham type chamber, it is equally sensitive if you are using a HDR source or LDR source or something like that. Yes, in High activity or low activity. Yeah. So it is a quite... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So well type chamber is suitable for LDR, HDR both? I mean, it is much more precise and sensitive, yeah. Whereas for other one... You need different adapters, of course. source is quite sources. weak, you need a sensitive chamber or something like that. You will see in the certificates that they state that the well chamber is, I think, um, in a range of 0.1 Curie up to 20 or 25 Curie, it's mm -hmm. linear. Mm -hmm. This is stated actually in, in their uh, documentation. 
but I just want to add something because I'm just in a process to investigate this a little bit more in detail because we have seen that our customer uh, customers measure a small difference between uh, PDR sources and HDR sources. Mm -hmm. And then I also found out that the manufacturer of the source on their certificate, they use a 3% different calibration factor for this. And customers are normally not aware about that. They have one certificate. So if they use PDR and HDR sources, they use one calibration factor for both, which seems also logical because it's linear in this range. Mm -hmm. But um, you need to be a bit careful. Um, and um, yeah, um, with, uh, with PTB for in branch wiring, we are just investigating this, if this mm -hmm. is really correct to use this 3% difference in the calibration what, factor. What sort of source of strength do you have in a PDR? One puree. One tenth, something like that. One tenth of a normal one. But I think this is uh, time for another, uh, for, for another comment. Um, you should not use the activity, you should use the air camera rate uh, that is also given in the certificate. That should, should not have the difference. Probably the difference is, sim is simply in the uh, dose rate, in the air camera rate constant that is used for a PDR source and a, an HDR source. These are different sources, so they have different constants. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, um, the, and they, the and they all have an uncertainty. That, that mm -hmm. may not yeah, be the problem with your case, but, but that, uh, that is one reason also why you, should, uh, why you should use the air camera rate. The air camera rate is directly measured and that sh yeah. should normally be uh, but, correct. But this, is, this is something where you see the difference between a well chamber and for example, a Krieger Fanto measurement. That, mm -hmm. that is the point. So it yeah. seems to be well chamber um, dependent and there is actually also a difference between the PTW well chamber and the standard imaging well chamber. So mm -hmm. it's quite interesting to investigate this. In our, in our hospital, we also do the air camera rate calibration. I believe is it, it is advisable because otherwise you always have to multiply with, uh, with an, or somebody has to multiply with an air camera rate constant. And that mm -hmm. always, that is an additional uncertainty that you can avoid by using uh, air camera rate. Absolutely, no question about that. Mm -hmm. Maybe actually there are differences also in the collecting volume of, of different types of well type chambers that which could could cause this kind of uh, yeah. differences between between the sources yeah. or that you use. So we are going to do a, a scan and then to do Monte Carlo simulations of the well chambers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So next question is, does there any recommendation about dose compensation, radiobiology repair assuming for prolonged treatment time, example, more than one hour? Read literature. I think that's the most important thing on that. Um, you, you can use biological models, of course, to, to compensate, but that's more or less well, it depends on, can, can you really trust the biological models? That there's a large it is related discussion to about all these things. It is related to biological modeling. If you want to compensate for the dose, if, if it, uh, what else would you be using? Otherwise, you, you simply need, need a longer time. Um, or, that, or that's the way I understood the question. Maybe it's maybe something else is known. Well, in, in, in the question, there's mentioned due to cold source. So um, you need really to think if this is still an HDR source. If you, if you, we know it's 74 days half-life for the iridium-192, and if the um, source gets older and older and drops down, let's say, to two Curie or one Curie, then it's not really HDR treatment yes. anymore. It goes to an MDR treatment range. Mm -hmm. And then the That's biological right. behavior is, of course, at least theoretically different. I mean, if you look in the papers, you don't see, uh, basically you don't see a difference uh, using a PDR source or an HDR source. I mean, PDR is a simulating of an LDR system, um, but from the results, you can hardly see any difference. But nevertheless, I would not, also because of the source cycles, I would not use, uh, let's say, a depleted HDR source as a kind of PDR source. This is not, not a good way to do, the, to do that. So, so, so last limit of the dose uh, source activities, two QD. After that, we have to change? 
we should not treat the patient or we should do the patient treatment until the next source is coming normally i would recommend that yes no i mean norm normally the source change we do like after three months the quarterly every quarter if it is iridium source because you can think of after 74 days has reached the half life so you have if you have 10 query source and after 74 days it is five curie so you are doing the same treatment and the treatment time will be automatically the double than what was in the 10 curie or something like that so naturally 20 74 days is less than three months but we prefer to change the source every three months now i know many hospitals they don't have much patient but they have diverse patient so like so what they do is that they order the source once a year or once in every six months or a year. So they order the source, they have a HDR unit and they order a HDR source and they do the HDR treatment and then they let the source decay. And when the source reaches the PDR area, then they do the PDR treatment. So like we are doing- End of the cycle, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nuprit plants and like uh, simple if we are doing intra cavity that is okay we are going for an interstitial and a good implants now uh, mm -hmm. uh, i think in that case uh, the treat uh, the cure activity of the source should be in a hdr range mm -hmm. uh, a doctor should not uh, give the patient treatment because he is in a pain now he has to stay in the uh, hospital also for a treatment also it is taking one hour time for the treatment one by one all channels uh, I think there should be some limit or recommendation if we are going for the higher uh, good implants now like uh, interstitial and like that in that cases we should not treat the patient in a uh, PDR ranges because patients are having so much pain also I mean you, 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 yes. in terms of, you mean in terms of time yeah in terms but, of time, but, but remember, that depends also number of channels of the treatment yes, or something like. Channels so if you're doing a prostate treatment of say 15 and 20 channel, then also at the beginning, when the source strength is 10 query, that will also take like but, uh, around uh, one hour treatment or 45 minutes treatment with all the dummy runs and everything or something like that. If you're yes, doing yes. a three channel gyne treatment, then if the source strength is 10, Curie or the source of strength is five Curie, you're finishing the treatment anyhow within one, half an hour or something like that. So that depends also number of channel treatments. Yes, sir. Yes. yes. Or number of dual with, positions. Also. With prostate, you would use anesthesia. With yeah. gynecological treatment, you may not. So it's yeah. it's less tolerable. Mm -hmm. But I think the patient tolerance is really the is is really the point. And from the physical side. If you have uh, an, a rigid applicator in 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 a uh, in a patient, a cervix applicator, for instance, for an hour, uh, I think it becomes dangerous that the that the patient will move and the applicator will move, and and uh, your dose that will change your dose distribution. I think that is that's the reason why you should keep the time yes, shorter. Sir. Yes, sir. yes. Sir. There, there is one additional aspect that I would like to mention. You have in the inside the machine, you have a Kajabula counter. So this, uh, this counter is detecting radiation, of course. And if this counter does not detect any radiation, the machine will retract the source. So if you, if you have a very weak source and you have a big it's patient, a low, yeah. mm -hmm. you shield your source. And sometimes it happens that the Geiger-Müller counter does not detect any radiation. And then this, the source is automatically retracted because the machine thinks there is something Incorrect with the with the electronic over the machine. And <laughs> it cannot find the source. You want to avoid it must this. be an old so, source. <laughs> yeah. yeah to, to be honest, we have a different threshold for the HDR machines and for the PDR machines. Yeah. So if it drops below two Curie activity for the HDR machine, that can happen. That mm. the machine will retract mm -hmm. the source and will tell you you have not enough mm -hmm. enough activity or or the Geiger Müller uh, counter is defective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I have one doubt. Uh, sometimes in a patient, a tandem length is not actual to the uterus length. Is it clinical decision to not take in the tandem length equal to the uterus length? Or by mistake, they have put the uh, different length? It should be equal to the uterus length, always? 
this is definitely a clinical decision. Clinical decision. Yeah. Yeah. If okay. you know that there's no tumor at the at the top of the uterus, I think you could use a shorter. Okay, sir. Uh, one more question: If there is a symmetry or a shift of a ovoid from its actual position, can we accept point A values ninety eight percent or one zero two percent, or we should shift the central axis of the tandem one mm or one point five so that the A one and A two will receive hundred percent like we have planned for the intracavitary plannings? What to do? I, mean, I have... We had a similar question uh, with the last presentation. I can tell you my recommendation is keep point A um, with respect to the cervical os. So mm -hmm. measure from the cervical os, this two centimeter to the side and up, and yeah. don't move your point A into the high dose region of an ovoid. Yes. The point A should be in this region where you still have isodos lines that go parallel along your tendon. Right. It should not be moved into the high dose gradient area. And even if you have some, if it's a small deviation between your ovoids, you can of course um, just still take the, uh, let's say, um, top of your caps and calculate from this line, even if it's a bit tilted. Yeah? But if, it's, it's, if you see really, like when you use a Fletcher applicator and you see that your phonicis or, or that your um, ovoid caps are far away, let's say far away means a few millimeters away from your cervical os, then I would I would always relate to the cervical os as the reference. Okay, then so in, in my experience, the doctor has said uh, to put 102% on a left or right side. If there is, I think they are taking decision as per the left or right, there is a tumor more. That's why they're uh, taking more dose to the left side or the right side. But not by moving point A. You should not point move point A. You should no, always we are keep. Not, we are normalizing right. to the point A, but yes. because of the uh, avoid uh, asymmetry or a shift, the dose to the point A is uh, as per the planning is coming more. Well, we, 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 uh, in that institute, we don't have any other uh, flatter shoot with interstitial implants like that. So all are they are in our planning. They are trying to fit the dose coverage as per the uh, their requirements so they are saying you try to cover this area and whatever the point a is receiving 102 and left side is 98 percent i am accepting this plan yes. like that they they are the, do they use high risk ctv and intermediate risk ctv and so on do they do they contour no sir the planning was on a like uh, ct planning not mri but well, you could some do that experienced on CT oncologist. Too. You could do this on CT, but I think uh, uh, shape surface where you want it at your dosage point, but you shape it locally so that at point A, or so that the inner um, the inner high region should not uh, uh, change too much. Mm. Do this locally. And then you will find that point A does not have the um, um, does, does not have the prescription dose, and normally point A has a lower, uh, in many cases has a lower dose actually than than the prescription dose, but it can also have a higher dose if your if your uh, uh, prescription point is uh, close to okay, uh, point A. Uh, one more question: If there is a perforation of the uterus because of retroverted uterus or a wrong angle selection of the uh, tandem, in that case, uh, from how much distance we should active the dwell positions, or uh, we should abort the plan or the application? I would say first of all, it's it's common if you use just radiographs that you can perforate your uterus. So I've seen that at sites where they just use radiographs and they don't see that they have perforated the uterus on the radiographs. Therefore, it's a good argument to plan CT-based or to use MRI. In addition, if you use a cervical sleeve, then the likelihood is, is minimized, of course, that you perforate anything. 
because if you use a cervical sleeve, you have a limitation to put your uh, probe or to push your probe into the uterus. And if it really happens and the doctor is aware of this, if he sees that the uterus is, is perforated, uh, I think in most cases you can still treat. There are some doctors who stop the treatment, who, who, who don't want to use um, HER treatment anymore for this patient. But I think the majority would still use this um, possibility to treat. So. But it's a clinical decision. Clinical decision. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. Huh. So in some cases now, if the pay, uh, lady is a very old, uh, I have seen one patient in which now the application was all first attempt, second attempt. It was not all, it was never be an exact position of the all appli uh, applicator geometry in the patient anatomy perfectly. So the planning doses to the rectum and to the bladder all are now having higher doses. In some patients, uh, it is very difficult to do the plans and doctor wants to be perfect. So in that cases, what should the medical physicist should comment? It's also a clinical decision. Can this patient yeah. tolerate it? You, you need to discuss this with your radiation oncologist and do as good as you can. And it'll be some kind of a compromise, I guess. You will have some, you'll have to make a compromise between the, the, the hot doses and the, um, um, uh, and the uh, target coverage. But I think for all of these things, um, it is helpful if you, if you use, um, uh, if you contour the, the, uh, the, the organs. So first use CT planning, contour the organs, um, define high risk and, and uh, intermediate risk uh, targets. Then you have more information on what kind of dose you are giving and, and where you should give the dose and what is actually happening. I, I think that, um, this will give different solutions in different patients, but it will give you much more information so that you know how to decide. Yes, sir. Uh, so one more question. Uh, for intracavitary 3D planning, is it mandatory to contouring the body external, external body? This I is a question of the algorithm that you are using. For example, yes. if you use TG43 as a water calculation, you don't need a body contour. Mm -hmm. But if you use um, these um, new models that take into account tissue density, then of course you need this. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so one more question. In a brachytherapy, should the staff used, uh, should use the personal protective devices include the appearance thyroid shield? I think don't. Normally not. Normally your, your machine sh uh, should uh, give you good shielding. Actually, um, uh, in radiation therapy, the, the personnel should actually not be exposed to any dose at all, almost. Yeah. The so machines are safe the, enough so that, so that they... The, uh, it may be the era when we tried to put the source by the uh, clips in the patient anatomy, like radium time. That time we may have to be used the Appearance and these things. At that time, yes. If you if you are ma manually uh, handling Manual. uh, radioactive sources, of course, you need to you need to use uh, protection. And I think yes, aprons for radium they're not very efficient, but since it has a high energy, but you should still use a thyroid. Why not? Yeah. Um, I think uh, if I can answer, because we had this discussion here also, and in brachytherapy is quite important is the mobility now and that's why you should not wear or have your body covered with so much heavy things or something like that that naturally it compromises your mobility or something like that because if the emergency situation arises you have to take the decision and the movement it has to be very quick or something like that mm -hmm. and as Frank said also, the source is quite secured if emergency situation doesn't arrive. An emergency situation is uh, when it arrives, then naturally you have to take some dose or something like that. Yes. But naturally, if you are mobile now, then you'll be actually getting less dose or yes. something like that. Yeah. Probably better to. Yeah.
yes, to stay mobile if, if you if you really have to rescue a source in an, in an emergency. Yeah. yeah, it's a high activity source. I mean, if you have iridium or cobalt, you can't really shield yourself with this uh, apron, with apron and, yeah. and it's just yeah. a waste of time. It's better yeah. to, to optimize the time that you are inside a room when there is an emergency. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing manual uh, afterloading, if you still do that, actually, um, look into, into, in, into the f uh, my slides in the first lecture. You will see that the, 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 there was an intermediate technique where you put the catheters in, and then you put the, the source in. So uh, it's what, what they called manual afterloading. And I think that, that would be a, the advisable thing to do. You can do that and take your time placing the catheters. And then it's a quick process to, to additionally um, put in the sources. Okay, sir. So I think uh, this is the last question. I will check if there is one, any other question. The bracket is there. Yeah. So all the questions are completed. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Dr. George, Dr. Moment Hark, Dr. Renate Walter, and Dr. Frank Hensley. For experience with would like to thank to chairman of the CCR this opportunity. I'm looking forward to serve the organization in any aspect. This course has been accredited by the International Organization for the Mar 22, 22 22 CPD credit points. Its main motto is to provide quality education and health science for the patient benefits. Thanks to the all participants once again. We appreciate your presence here. At the end of this series, we are having examination on 26th of February. The exam examination is going to be held on the basis of our lectures. There will be 25 MCQ questions for all the lectures and the presentations are already shared with you all by our program manager, Mohammed Ullah Shimanto. He will send you the instructions for the examination. If you have any doubts or queries, kindly contact him. Thank you once again to all the speakers and participants it was very interactive uh, and very good experience for me to join this SMPCR e-learning platform. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You mm -hmm. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you all. Uh, now I would like to request uh, the CEO of SMPCR, Professor Dr. Hasin Nunukum Ajari, to uh, conclude the session with a vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, Simanto and Madhubi District. Uh, can you hear me, all of you? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, ma'am. So. Mm -hmm. So I am very happy to have uh, all of you speakers from different countries, India, Australia, G Germany, and with lectures and uh, including the practical sessions. Thanks to all of you, uh, Dr. Frank, Dr. Renate, Dr. Mamun Hawk, and Dr. George Shikart for having so nice discussions and everything. We are trying to have a good arrangement. I think we are trying our best to do our uh, this arrangement uh, for somehow we are uh, planning to do our own platform so today is some technical problems we just switched into the zoom sessions so i hope the participants are very curious and they are continuously asking to have more sessions like these because it include all of the things including practicals dr george shekert and uh, Dr. Frank has shows very clearly how it is done and where uh, the question is like all on practical things. So I'm very happy to have you with us. And the questions we'll send, already we have got the, all the questions and we'll send the questions answer uh, also to you to just have a cross double cross check. Then we'll send uh, the answer, uh, these things to the certificate distribution to all of you. So thank you to all and everyone.
you have helped us enormously without any questions you just communicate with us and always cooperate with us and i think in future your help is very much necessary for the scmpc year to do a qualified medical physicist and which is our goal for the steel manpower in the south asian regions but in the online programs we have got more many participants outside the south asia regions so i think you will be with us and i will ask participants if you have any comments or any things like this you you will get emails of the speakers as well as you have and would like to have any sessions or any course what you would like to have please uh, send us emails and then we would like to arrange this type of course on which topics you want we would like to arrange these things and i will also ask my, our trainers please be with us and also suggest some trainers from different areas so you can collect more trainers in the SMPCR and all together we can have a good pool of trainers to develop skilled medical physicists in futures. So thanks the moderators and they have Thank you, a great jobs. Thank uh, you ma'am. Yes, Pia Sani and uh, Madhupi Dixit and also Jannath. So we would like to have from each country's one moderators. So you can, all the medical physicists, we are suggesting all should be medical physicists on the topic so they can also learn these things and they can have communication with different trainers. And this is our chance to have meet with you and thanks to all. Thanks everyone. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. Thank you all. I would like to request all the participants to open your camera. We will have a screenshot of the session. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I would like to remind all the participants to join the online examination at 26 February. I will send you the instruction how the examination will be proceed. Thank you so much. If anyone have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me in my email and WhatsApp. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye. Uh, good, good luck, everybody. Thank you. Good luck with the exam man. also. Yeah. Thank yes. you, sir. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Thank, yeah, you. Sure, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you, everybody.